sort of like the Jewish line, we explored the Jewish line uh, in one breath, almost, and then we explored the Western Satiricism line, and we saw how they two sort of intermingled with each other. Now what I left out was details about this, the actual doctrine itself. So the first half was more like historical, now we're gonna dive a little bit into Kabbalah. Um, by the way, if I speak too fast, please let me know. Um, yeah, I speak fast? Okay, so I'm going to speak a lot slower, uh, but if I have a tendency to speak faster, just let me know, just raise your hands, just speak a lot slower. Okay, also for loudness and all that, because I'm just kind of counting on you guys to let me know how things are going. So, um, we're going to start um, examining uh, this diagram, and I'm going to go back a little bit and, um, and talk a little bit about, historically, uh, when Kabbalah emerged, uh, a lot of scholars believe that um, it was it emerged as sort of like a response to Jewish philosophy, which was really prominent in the around that time, uh, around the, the Middle, Age, Middle Ages, the 12th century, especially. Uh, it was championed by a guy named Maimonides, and he was this Aristotelian philosopher, which has this sort of like separation of like the creator and the creation, and um, the catalyst. Um, subscribe to a more neoplatonic view, and that's that there's no separation between the creator and the creation. It's all just emanations that emanate from one source. It's a little bit like the sun. When you think about it, this is actually an example that we see in Plotinus and also in some Kabbalistic texts. They say, well, you have the sun, and you have the rays of the sun. Obviously, the rays, the, 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 the cosmic rays or the, the rays of the sun at the source are very, very hot, but when they get to Earth, they're a lot colder, but they still have the same essence. It's still warm. And so that's really the, 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 the main aspects of the uh, emanation uh, theory. Now, um, what the catalyst uh, simply did was, you know, when you have like the source and you have the emanation sort of propagating from the source, what they did was they classified this, the, 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 the emanations that were closest to the source as one category. And then as the, as we create a distance from the source, we create a set of different categories. Um, obviously, there's going to be the emanations closer to the source are going to have different characteristics than the one closer to us. So, um, we um, speak okay? Okay. <laughs> um, and so we have these different classifications of emanations, and this is essentially what we get. We have like Kepler, which is like the closest one, and then we have Malkut, which is our domain over here. Now, um, we're going to go over some of the characteristics of this diagram itself. Uh, we have here, for example, we have the pillar system. So we have three uh, lines that we see, three vertical lines that we see in the diagram itself. And each one of them have their own characteristics. The left side represents the divine feminine. For the feminine side, we have the right side, which is uh, the masculine, and then we have the middle part, uh, which is uh, sort of like mediates between the two. Um, and then we have colors also that uh, associated uh, that 
the, to correspond to it. So when you walk around in the exhibition, if you see certain colors, maybe things will mean something to you that maybe before. Um, the bottom, um, Sephira, the bottom in the emission down there, could be either blue or um, black, even though it's in the middle pillar um, of, the, of the tree. Um, now, as I mentioned, um, Lurian and Kabbalah, a very complicated system, um, and as, as you remember the story with the breaking of the vessels, the vessels rearranged themselves into um, a new configuration, and that's the Kratzofim uh, configuration, as we see here, and instead of 10 emanations, or 10 sephirot, we now have five configurations. Um, and uh, this is almost, this is called the parts of film, or the, the faces of the divine, and we see almost like a representation of a divine family of sort. You know, we have the mother, we have the father, we have Zaira and Kim, which is the son of the groom, representing the divine masculine, and then we have Nukba, the daughter, which is also called the bride, which is the, the, representing the divine feminine. Now, Kabbalistic practice, essentially, what they're trying to do um, is to take the divine feminine and the divine masculine and unite them sexually together. That, that's sort of like one of the goals that we see in Kabbalistic practices. Um, now, we do have some, um, uh, I actually gave a talk last week about Kabbalistic meditations, so I wanted to use some of the slides to give you a little bit more of a, a practical uh, approach to this. Um, so here we have divine names. There's a divine name associated with sort of like the middle structure there, with the middle <laughs> masculine. And then we have, uh, this one is the tetragrammaton, the, the four-letter name of the divine. And then we have the word Adonai, which represents the divine feminine. And then you do what's called a unification. You dovetail the letters to the, together in the meditation, and that unites the divine feminine and the divine masculine together. Um, Moshe Cordovero actually has, uh, incorporates this specific meditation also during the sexual practices. So during the, the sexual practice itself, you have the divine masculine, uh, well, the male practitioner identifies themselves with the divine masculine, and then you have the female practitioner identifies with the divine feminine, and then the sexual union below, hopefully, will produce a sexual union above. And this is the meditation that they continue, continuously are contemplating during the sexual act itself. A little bit of body parts as well. Um, there's many different trees, there's many different configurations. Remember, there are, there are lots of these different Kabbalistic groups, and each group had like their own, own interpretation of like what goes where and where and who and what. Um, so for the most part, the crown is sort of like the top of the head. This is sort of like the, the Sephira of Keter, and we have that um, sort of representing almost like the place where a king would wear a crown. So it's like the forehead and the, the top of the head. We have the Sephira of Chokhmah representing the right side of the head, and then we have Yuna representing the left side of the head. Um, Tif Eret, uh, which means beauty, representing the chest or the heart area. We have uh, the hands, the chesed and gura. We have sort of love and, and mightiness, or mercy and mightiness. And then we have down there, we have the two legs, netzach and hod. And we have the soul, the foundation, around the general areas. We have the two legs, um, oh, we have the two legs, and we have the foundation, and then we have the foot, which in some earlier configurations represent the feet, because the feet, the malchut is associated with the earth, so they thought, well, maybe it's associated with the feet. Now, in Luriani Kabbalah, things get a little bit more specific, and um, there's actually a difference between men and women here. Um, the yesod actually represents, it still represents the genitals, but it represents the phallus, and the foot represents the glanus penis, which is the tip of the phallus. And then in women, it's a little bit different. The so represents the womb, and then the uh, hood represents either the vagina or the actual the clitoris itself. Um, and so they get very, very specific about uh, uh, in, in Luriana Kabbalah about everything. Um, and I think you see um, this, this, this is just some variation. Also on the left there, we see a quasi sephira, a quasi emanation called that. And which means knowledge, and the reason uh, it's there um, is because sometimes it kept there, the crown is not there. The, the, the story that people usually when they learn this is that well, the king when he goes to bed doesn't wear the crown, so he puts the crown, mm -hmm. so he doesn't have the crown all the time with him. Um, and so, but you can't have less than ten 
superior. They have the panda number of perfection. Um, and so that's why you add or into consideration dot. Dot, as far as the body part, usually represents the throat, uh, but in the Marianic system, it can represent the lower dot. There's a lower dot that represents the throat. It's also a higher upper dot, which kind of mitigates between the left side of the head and the right side of the head. It's actually considered to be it's sort of like the lower bottom part of the head itself. Okay, so now we get into Kabbalistic worlds. Now the Kabbalistic worlds um, are another classification system that we see that, that the Sephiroth organize themselves. As we said before, there's the source and then there's the emanations that kind of propagate from the source. And we have, it's just a different way to classify. These are like basically five domains that we see the emanations uh, exist in. And of course, they correspond. We already have a, a, a five part division of the Sephiroth as well, and, and they match up quite uh, nicely. So um, we have Adam Kadmon, the primordial man, representing the highest most world. Then we have Atsilut, emanations, the world of creation, Yah, the world of Yitzhak, formation, and we actually exist. In the world of Asiya. Um, there's a few different ways which we can um, represent the actual worlds themselves. Um, you have to realize that it's actually a tree, an actual tree configuration within each world itself. So things get a little bit more complicated. Um, this is sort of like on the left side, they're just kind of stacked it, um, sequentially, but uh, a lot of times you see them stacked right on top of each other with the lower sphera of one tree corresponding with the upper sphera of the tree that's underneath it. So there's this overlap. Um, and this is, this is true also when you're looking at the design, the metaphysical um, uh, cosmos, you know, the upper always kind of reaches down to the lower, and the lower kind of reaches up to the upper, and so it's almost like a chain of it that we see then. And uh, when you go around, I think there's some, some configurations that you'll see. I think upstairs is also, you'll see things that are very similar to this. Um, going back to Papros, we see also this idea that each Sephira itself has a tree within a tree. Um, and so we get worlds that have trees inside of them, we have Sephira that have trees inside of them, and you can really get lost really, really quickly, really quickly when you get into the, the text themselves because you don't know where you are. Um, are you in the general tree, or one level down, or several levels down? Um, which, where, where are we? You know, it's, it's very, it's, it's very, very, Complicated, and there's many different commentaries that talk about the different uh, the different kind of trees, and different commentaries will say, "Well, no, you're actually over here." Another one will say, "No, you're actually over there." Um, and there's a lot of different inconsistencies. Um, Luria himself, um, he basically just taught. He, it seems as though he was some kind of channeling some sort of a, a wisdom, and he didn't really bother to like connect and do all these little connections and things. It was really his students. And particularly Chaim Vital, his most prominent student, they kind of had to like go back and for the rest of his life, remember, we only taught for two years. Mm -hmm. And then but for the rest of Chaim Vital's, Vital's life, he kind of tried to like, okay, where's the system here? Let's try to make sense of all these different levels and sub-levels. Um, and by contemplating these trees, by contemplating, you know, trying to figure out where you are, that's the Kabbalistic practice in itself. You're contemplating the divine while you're engaging yourself in the text itself. Um, I want to mention uh, something about uh, this idea of having a tree within the Sephira himself. It's very tricky for the scribes to actually represent this. Um, and uh, this, didn't, this was too big of a resolution for that. But we see here like one attempt to demonstrate that there's a tree within one Sephira by having the list of all the other Sephira being placed sort of like circularly around uh, in a circle. And, um, and so this is like a scribal trick to, well, how, how do we do that? Do we write a full other tree and like have an arrow to it, like we have in Papros? Well, here with Moshe Kodavero, we have a different solution for this. Um, we also see a very interesting tree. You'll see something uh, like this if you go to the exhibition, a very blown up uh, figure. And here we see Another strategy, we see the Sephira listed almost like a spokes on the wheel. And this particular manuscript, and there's a copy of this manuscript here at the uh, as well, um, that you can actually move the wheels. It's actually movable wheels. And you can actually align different spokes with the other spokes 
above. And it's actually a really cool to, to play around with. Um, but really, you see here a strategy um, to, to, uh, to incorporate the, the trees within the tree. Now, um, something that's uh, interesting about this, um, the image on the right comes from uh, Galico. And the image on the left is from Moshe Kodavera. Moshe Kodavera will uh, produce from me more to the pomegranates. The image on the right is nectar of the pomegranate. It's supposed to be a summary version of the, uh, or, um, the orchard of the pomegranates. And the image on the right um, is supposed to um, reflect the image on the left. But we do see um, some uh, specific differences. Uh, before, before we go into that, I just want to mention that image that I showed you before, Kirji also has this very economical way of putting the, the sephiro. Um, but going back to the, to the comparison, and um, we see that uh, even though the, the image on the right is supposed to be exactly the same as the image on the left, it's a little bit different. Now, what's, in Red Seas, what's the main difference between the two, besides the, the description of the sephiro? Different paths. We have different paths. Um, and especially if you look at the bottom, that's a very that's a big telltale sign. We on the image on the right we have three different paths end up at the lowest sephira, the lowest emanation. On the image on the left, which is very typical of the spot catalyst, and Luria also used uh, this configuration because the very use, we have everything being channeled into your soul, into the foundation, and then in one stream being channeled into the divine feminine, the last sephira. So we have the masculine sort of gathering all the cosmic force and just um, uh, pummeling it down into the divine uh, feminine. And here we have a representation of, it's actually an older representation of the tree. This one is a little, this one is from the, the spot catalyst. This is an earlier tree. And I'm not exactly sure why he didn't just copy Moshe Cordovero. If this is supposed to be a summary book where he summarizes for this movie, why not just copy it, you know, path by path? But no, he actually reverts to an older version of the tree. And when you look around at the exhibition, you will not be able to tell. You'll see that there's a difference between all these different trees. You'll have um, trees that will have these three paths, and then you also have trees that have a singular path. And, um, and it's just something to uh, think about when you're walking around and viewing all these trees. Um, I'm going to end there, because I, I know you guys have questions, and I want you also to be able to walk around and view the exhibition as well. Um, so I think we're going to go into the question time. So. Methods, what, what should come to mind? That's a very good question. Um, and like I said um, earlier, when we talked about the different styles and the different Kabbalistic schools, you know, it could be many, many different things. You know, you have a theoretical school, you know, it, it teaches the, the theory and the doctrines. I mean, that, that's a method into itself, dealing with the doctrines themselves and the theoretical, and trying to understand, like in William Kabbalah, where are you? And in, uh, in, in what is he talking about? That's one method. There's also Kabbalistic methods could also mean, um, of course, this is in the Jewish line, right? Um, uh, Kabbalistic may also mean uh, uh, Kabbalistic meditations. Um, I should mention that the, all these schools, you have the theoretical and the meditative school and the magical school, they're not mutually exclusive. You know, you can have uh, meditations in the theoretical line, and you can have some magical stuff in there as well. So they're not mutually exclusive. So when you're saying Kabbalistic methods, it could mean yeah, either a theoretical study, it could mean an actual meditation, or it could mean a magical operation. So it could mean many, many different things. Um, you can also think about it in this way, because um, Kabbalah is sort of embedded in Judaism. Um, and, and the Jewish belief has um, their daily prayers, you know, there's the liturgical practices, you know, and also some non-liturgical practices. Um, and then the Kabbalists, um, took these, these, uh, these daily prayers, these daily meditations, 
and really assign like a mystical significance to everything. And um, and it's almost it's almost like they were trying to look under the hood to see how how does it work? What are we doing when you say this prayer? What what exactly are we tweaking in the divine? You know? And so when you saying that some so you can say that some prayers are just prayers, but some prayers some people will say, well, these are Kabbalistic prayers. Um, it's a little bit tricky to say because the Kabbalists will say, well, if you just say the prayer, it's going to work no matter what. But if you say, like, for example, with intention, with Kabbalistic intentions, or if you do that unification meditation, doing it, you know, it amplifies the effect. So this is a, a wide variety of uh, uh, Kabbalistic methods. In the Western esotericism tradition, you know, we have people, you know, Kabbalah is kind of used as a buzzword these days. You know, uh, people, you know, there's uh, Kabbalistic astrology. You know, Kabbalistic Reiki, and you know, they, they try to, I mean, because it's a nice buzzer. It was, I, think, I think it competes with like Tantra. There's also like Tantric Reiki and Tantric um, astrology and all that. I think, you know, competing on, on uh, who has this and the uh, sensational word. Um, but then, yeah, you get, you get into like, you know, what is a Kabbalistic method? Well, anything that really involves the Sephiroth is a Kabbalistic method, you know, in general. I know sort of maybe a non Hebrew um, Kabbalah question. In later traditions like the Golden Dawn, they call ways um, of mapping either a lightning flash onto the Sephirot, yeah. or the Sephirot descending the tree of life, yeah. as inspiration coming out. But also, some people even map on a snake, yeah. either for descent or ascent. But is, is there any evidence of that in the earlier traditions, or is this a really modern sort of development? Yeah, there is actually. Um, um, <coughs> obscure, but, but there is some. Some aspect. I remember, like in the Kabbalah of uh, Israel Saruk, which is one of the purported students of Isaac Luria, yeah. the way that the creation of the world, remember the description that we have of the world as like this being this bubble being impregnated. Well, he gives a little bit more detail about that, and he said, well, and he incorporates the Hebrew alphabet. So he said, well, what happened was the letter Yud sort of like entered into this space, but it couldn't be received. There wasn't any sort of like receptive aspect to it, so he went back. Okay. Then it went back in, and then again it couldn't be received, and it went back out, but it got lodged at the sort of like the, the membrane mm -hmm. between the infinite and the, the bubble, right? Yeah. And then through this yod, uh, the divine influx was able to kind of come in through the letter yod and extending it into into a noon, actually. The last the ending noon, which which is actually the noon in, in also in Arabic and, and it's a serpent. Uh, so we have this serpent, and in a sense, you kind of you can you can kind of make sense of this because um, the serpent, or the things that are associated with the left side of the of the tree, is a limiting sort of thing. So with the right side of the tree, the masculine side is this all bestowing thing. Mm -hmm. The left side, the uh, the aspect of judgment, is sort of like this restraint, and so it's a it's a boundary setting kind of thing. Yeah. And so it does actually make sense because the divine was actually constricting himself and trying to. Um, Really putting like a real like a sliver of light, and so he's really trying to constrict the light to make sure it doesn't overwhelm the system. Of course, he actually did, and that's where we get the breaking of the vessel. Yes, yes. But we do have this. Uh, the, the metaphors seem to kind of stack up. I don't think that Crowley knew all this. No, no. But is there a connection? There is actually an interesting connection. With, with, uh, with the yeah. Yes. Is there any any attempt to at a three-dimensional uh, representation mm. of this, this tree of life. It's also flat. It's, the world is flat yeah. there. And the world mm. is. So mm. have they tried? Is there a, a way of making it three-dimensional and that also yeah. make these two representations come together more? Yeah. Um, so the question was, um, is there a three, three-dimensional representation of uh, of this uh, tree of life diagram? Um, the answer is yes. And this is actually one of the reasons why Lumiani Kabbalah is so complicated. Because we get these visuals. I mean, it's really, especially Saruk, we're talking about Saruk, he's very visual. He talks about spheres yeah. instead of yeah. circles. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in, uh, in, uh, when you get into sort of the, the Lumiani thing, obviously it's very hard to dis display it here. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a very three dimensional space. You know, we have all the, all the circular aspects, it's actually a ball, it's actually like a sphere, you know, with all these different layers in it, so it's a ball within a ball within a ball within a ball. Within a ball. So there is a, a three-dimensional aspect to that. Um, you have to use your imagination a lot, 
Um, there is a book, I think is a translation um, of uh, the Tree of Life, which is one of the main texts in Yuan Kabbalah, and they actually try to map out the diagrams. Uh, now, most of the diagrams are not very really accurate, but it's 3D diagrams, and you see like the balls, the different balls, and different sort of like the, the slices of each uh, layer and layer. Um, so yes, it is, it is represented in 3D, but it's very difficult to, uh, to also, even for us today, to, to represent that. Yeah. Yes? Um, I see a problem with Christian Kabbalah. The, the Hebrew does have, only has consonants. Greek has vowels. I would expect that Christian Kabbalah would be a comment on the Gospels, which are written in Greek. Mm -hmm. How is this so? How is is this solved because of the vowel points? I'm not sure I understand the question. No, 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 no. Could you repeat the question? Yes, I can repeat the question. Hebrew yeah. uh, consists only of consonants. Okay. Greek has also vowels. Mm -hmm. If you are into Christian Kabbalah, you would be interested in a Kabbalistic interpretation of the Gospels, mm -hmm. which are written in Greek, not in Hebrew. Yeah. Then. Uh, you come up with different values for words. Yeah. So how is this solved? It, it gets even more complicated. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things that I actually cut out of the presentation is this uh, Exodus technique called Gematria. And Gematria is basically the, the art, you can say, of taking Hebrew letters and assigning a numerical value mm -hmm. to them. And so each word, just by adding, you can add up the numbers, produces a sum. And so you can find these hidden relationships between words that seemingly don't seem to relate to each other, but just the, the numerical value. And it gets very, very intricate calculations. Now, specifically with vowel points, um, vowels play a really big role in Kabbalah, actually. Um, the, there's different vowels that are assigned to different emanations. And during the meditations, you can actually, like I said, you know, you can dovetail the words together, where you can do that, and then you can take the vowel points from a biblical verse, if it has a certain type of resonance, and you can apply it to your meditation as well. So you have the word, the word that I had dovetailed together didn't have any vowel points. Um, so yeah, Hebrew has consonants, but he also has vowels in vowel points, and, different things, and it has also different other aspects as well. Um, and so it's a very, so one way of solving the problem is that you just, you, uh, it's not really a problem, because you, you have so many different techniques that allows you to start comparing things, um, you know, and, and, and it, it's, it's a new, it was a new tool, they, they went crazy for it. Now, something kind of interesting is that we saw with Workman, you know, he did the, the tetragrammaton and he had it deliver shin. Now, of course, that throws the math all the way, you know, like out the window because the, 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 the name itself is, is the basis for many, many different Kabbalistic computations. And this is also what I meant was why well, he didn't really apologize for it because you don't see him um, saying uh, new, com he doesn't come up with new calculations. He just says, "Well, no, the shin just needs to be there." Of course, he wins all the the calculus of computations, but hopefully that that kind of answers. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a differ. I'd Let's say as well. I mean, I can understand the supposition that Christians are going to be more interested in the New Testament, but actually, it's not true. Christian Kabbalists almost exclusively look at the Old Testament. You don't find that many um, calculations, for example, or other types of interpretation of the New Testament. You find them looking for Christian truths in the Old Testament. Um, one as a way of trying to convert Jews to Christianity. I mean, for example, the first word of the, the Old Testament, Bereshit, the first three letters, you know, uh, well, you can explain that with Bible and Bereshit, uh, that, that they symbolize uh, Son and Spirit and Father, the first three letters of, of Genesis. And so they use arguments like that. But also, a lot of the people into Christian Kabbalah are also involved in, as we discussed upstairs, they're into creation. And Genesis is where you go for anything on creation. You know, you don't look in the New Testament, you look in the Old Testament. So, so the, it's, I can understand the idea that they should be interested in, in the Gospels, but actually they're really looking in the Old Texts. For prefiguration, so they, they know Solomon is important, and they're trying, for example, to read Solomon the text. <coughs> That breaks down maybe the strict expectation that they should be reading the Gospels. It's odd. <coughs> but uh, they, 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 Richland, for example, you mentioned. Yeah. I, I actually can't remember if he, he, he used to 
discussing Jewish texts and showing how they're useful for Christians to discover new truths in what we like to do in texts. And uh, some Christians are delighted and some are really scared because their whole belief system, their, their nice, careful sort of idea of what they understand as Christianity is threatened because of these new discoveries. He was a very big uh, protector of the Jewish heritage. Yes, he was. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Protecting the books and protecting the tradition. Yeah, so, right. yeah, going through the Jewish books is, is very important to the Christian Catholics. Yeah, yeah, well, to some, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. very much so. Roy Clooney is definitely one. There's a battle of the books yeah. where he's certain of the common something Christians should be loved. And that's amazing. That's a watershed moment. People detested and thundered Orthodox Christians. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, uh, we're, <coughs> okay, I think we're done. Um, if you have any other questions, just come to me at the end. But we want to give you guys enough time to walk around the exhibition. So uh, have fun, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.